Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The show is about to begin. That made us interviews and stories, tales from the bus. We love taking you back to when it all went down. The greatest live shows and that cheering crowd sound. It's concerts, concerts that made us, concerts that made us.com. Hi, this is Chris Slade, and you're watching Concerts That Made Us.
As time unwinds There's no space There's no time Just the silence Of your mind Chris Slade, it's an honor to have you on Concerts That Made Us. Not at all. It's my pleasure. Now, the Chris Slade Timeline recently released the new album Timescape. It's a mix of originals and some of your favourite covers. Take us a bit deeper into it, if you can. Yeah, uh, well, there it is. That's the cover of it. That's a double CD. There's also downloads. Timeline I've always uh, recorded for the past 10 years. And we've got the same members, by the way. And uh, But it's always been covers. And this time, I started to get some ideas for some songs. Uh, I've always written lyrics, um, especially the 70s with uh, Man From Man's Earth Band. And I've always done lyrics anyway, just to try them out. Not that they ever got done, but <laughs> just to try my writing. And uh, I was really pleased with what was coming through. So we recorded some originals. And this timescape is the result of that. And it's the first time I've ever uh, been a lead singer. I've always done vocal backing, and I can sing in tune, which is a feat in itself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I say I, I never had a voice. When you work with people like uh, Tom Jones and Paul Rogers and David Gilmore, you don't think of being a singer yourself. <laughs> you <know>? True. <laughs> with those guys uh, up front all the time. So, uh, you know, I was really pleased at the way this turned out. Uh, and the record company wanted some ACDC in there, so we've been doing that, as I say, for 10 years, recording ACDC and Asia songs and uh, all sorts of uh, Uriah Heep, Mantra Band's Earth Band. We always recorded that when we had time, you know, because I thought it would come in handy, and it has, in the future. So... Uh, this is the first one. It's on Brave Words Records, where you can get downloads from, as opposed to a physical CD. Or you can get a double CD signed from chrislate.com. And uh, Chris Late, the Chris Late Timeline on Facebook. So um, I, I was really pleased with the way it turned out. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Are you uh, 
Are you kind of sorry you didn't move towards lead vocals maybe earlier in your career? Uh, yes, I do get a few things I didn't do earlier in my career. But yes, I could have developed it, but there was never any need. I was always um, playing as a drummer, you know, so, and it's uh, something I'm, I'm not as confident in as I am in my drumming. You originally formed the Chris Slade timeline back in 2012 to mark 50 years as a professional rock drummer. How did you go about putting a band together? You know, because to match yourself, you would need some heavy hitter musicians. Yeah, well, that's uh, why I formed uh, Timeline, actually, was because of these guys. I used to go and watch them work wherever they did, clubs and pubs. And if they were around my area, I would go and see them because they were doing covers, but they were doing things like Genesis and Kansas, both musically and vocally. And there's not many bands in uh, Britain that can do that and do it really, really well. Some do, but very few, you know, very few in my area. So I knew these guys were great musicians and they all sing. So they're all, you know, the Kansas stuff was just unbelievable. And they, uh, I approached them and uh, they were happy to do it because some people, oh, I can't play that because uh, I'm a heavy player, man. You know, uh, <laughs> I can do the ACDC. Yeah, well, I want somebody who can do a heap as well. Oh, okay. You know, so, and I've had bands before. I used to live in the States, but it's always been ACDC, tribute band, not tribute band, but uh, playing ACDC music because nobody ever wore shorts, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is what a tribute band I see as being a tribute band is that uh, they emulate ACDC in every way, even their mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> which aren't too many, but uh, <laughs> uh, ACDC are a great band and I was really proud to uh, be in them. Twice, actually. So uh, nobody else can say that. <laughs> very true, very true. Speaking of uh, ACDC, actually, you played on the Razor's Edge album. You were with them for a couple of years and you also played on my favourite ACDC song, Big Gun. I really like Big Gun. We do it. Uh, it's on this Timescape album, actually. It's a fantastic riff. Yeah. A crap movie. <laughs> a fantastic <laughs> riff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Arnold. Uh, <laughs> but uh, not one of his best, I'm afraid. But <laughs> the guys, Angus and Malcolm, you know, they were still, Malcolm was still alive then. And uh, we were on the plane and they, they gave me a, a CD with it on. And I thought it was absolutely tremendous, you know, because we had to learn it to play it, so to speak. So uh, we were flying to L.A. So they gave it to me on the plane, and I thought it was absolutely amazing. That riff is like uh, Peter Gunn. You know Peter Gunn? Yeah. Uh, it just rolls along and just don't stop. <laughs> That's for sure. That's why we play it in uh, Timeline because uh, it's such a great song, such a great riff. I always think it's a pity that they don't actually play it live. I don't think they've ever actually played it live, or maybe they did once or twice, but it's it's definitely up there with, you know, Back in Black and TNT and all the rest of them. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the problem was it was on a compilation album for a movie, uh, Last Action Hero, and it was a very successful uh, it sold millions, very successful album, but not much attention was paid to it. We played it, as you say, I think once or twice in ACDC live. That was the first time around, I believe, uh, but never since. And uh, that's why I love to play it in Timeline, because, uh, as I say, it's such a great riff and great song. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if we jump back right to the start, you started out at the age of 16 playing with Tom Jones. How did you get the gig with Tom Jones? Uh, we're from the same village in Wales. We were born a few hundred yards apart, about four streets from each other. Phil Campbell was born in the middle, <laughs> in the middle <laughs> street. Um, Phil Campbell of Motorhead. But of course, Ten, at least 10 years between each of us. So uh, Tom's now 80-something, uh, 80 83 or 4 or 5, somewhere around there. Same age as my brother. They went to school together, uh, or they went to the same school, should I say. And uh, I worked in a, a shoe shop on a Saturday, and the assistant there, one of the women, was a fan of the band that was then Tommy Scott and the Senators. Ah. And uh, this was before he was Tom Jones, because uh, being a singer in Wales with a name like Tom Jones, it's like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, which one? <laughs> who's the singer? Oh, Fred Smith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, which Fred Smith? Oh, that one, you know. Uh, uh, Tom Jones is a very common name. So he didn't use that name so i'd heard anyway that they'd uh, sacked their drummer the night before and uh lo and behold the next day after this uh, assistant lady had told me that they'd sacked their drummer the guitarist walked in to buy some shoes uh. <laughs> so uh, i was 16 he was 20 something so i was very nervous walking up to him there's a huge age gap but I got the courage and I walked up and said, uh, I hear you lost your drummer last night and I'm a drummer and I live by Tom, which I did. I was about half a mile from Tom. Never met him. My father knew him uh, because Tom used to go and sing in his uh, concert party called the Pontypridd Bright Lights. And they played the same places that uh, we used to play with Tom. Tommy's got in the Senators which is uh, in the valleys in Wales. And uh, going up and down that, uh, working men's clubs, coal miners and steel workers and their families. So you had to watch your language. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great time. We, we were really successful, worked almost every night of the week. And uh, that's how I, I, they came to my house to audition me. It was eventually arranged because, of course, no mobile phones in those days. Um, so it was the, the red phone box at the end of the street, you know, and you had to be there at a certain time to accept a call. Yeah. We finally got it together, and the guys came to my house where I had my drum kit permanently set up, brand new premier kit. And uh, they came in, said, you know, oh, well, hello. And do you know the start to walk, don't run? which I rattled off, which is the Ventures Walk, Don't Run, um, instrumental. And I rattled that, just the intro, off. And they said, okay, let's go to the pardon rehearse. <laughs> nice. So everybody picked up a drum each, and we walked to the bus stop, which was about uh, a 1,000 yards from my house. Got on a bus, went to Pondipreeth, changed buses with the drum kit, and got on another bus to go to Abercunnan to rehearse at the Thorn Pub. Yeah, yeah. You uh, you obviously eventually went on to Vegas and uh, the bright lights of Vegas. What were those days like? Is it as glitzy and glamorous, you know, as, as we like to think? Yeah, it was actually. And uh, Vegas was tiny compared to what it is today. Today it's a city. Then it was just a town based around the Strip, what's known as the Strip, which is where all the bright lights are and the hotels. And uh, it was literally this uh, small. I was, uh, There was nothing between the Strip and the mountains which surround Vegas. I used to live there uh, a few years back. And it's... Uh, it's a thousand times as big as it was in the 60s. 
I could imagine. I mean that a thousand times. Just massive. And uh, yes, it was it was shiny, it was glittery, false, all those things. Plenty of gangsters walking around, real gangsters. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the same though, all over the States. So when I uh, I was with Tom for seven years, right through the sixties. And uh, you know, it was a good time. Met Elvis Presley. In fact, he offered me a job <laughs> playing drums. Honestly, <laughs> oh, I'm wow. not making this up. And you know, we had a great time in the sixties. Yeah, yeah. You were. Uh, you're quite possibly the only person ever to turn Elvis down. Then, am I right in saying that? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Elvis. I'm too busy, man. <laughs> <laughs> Worst thing that ever happened to me professionally. Cut a long story short, I think Tom's management went to Colonel Tom Parker, Elvis's manager, uh, and said, you can't steal our drummer. Oh, man. I think that's what happened. But uh, I was going to go to rehearsals. I kept in touch with them all the time. I was going to go to rehearsals. I can't make rehearsals again because Tom's tour was getting extended and I was contracted to Tom. and. I should have just walked and said, sorry, man, you know, uh, this is Elvis Presley. And by the way, we weren't going to be working when uh, when Elvis was working. It was supposed to be a month in Las Vegas, and that was it. Right. But, uh, oh, I wish I'd done it. I should have just said to Tom, sorry, man, I'm off. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It'd be it'd be interesting to think how your career would have went if you had of because obviously you would have spent all those years with Elvis then in, in Vegas. But um jumping ahead, you know, it's an Irish podcast. I feel like I have to mention you played with Gary Moore as well. That's actually what led to ACDC. But back to Gary Moore, what was it like working with such a legendary character like him? It's great. I was with him for a year, 88, 89, the year in that. I really enjoyed it. There's a good uh, video on YouTube somewhere of a gig in Dublin. And it's I think it's really good. So uh, anybody who's interested in that should have a look because it's uh, Gary Moore in Dublin live. And uh, ah, it was good. He was a great player. Great, great player. Of course, everybody knows that. Was he was he aware of how good he was? Was there an ego with him, or was he just a really down to earth guy? Um, I'm sure he was aware of how good he was. Ego wise, not not so much. I used to meet him before I worked with him. Uh, I can't remember why I did. Maybe we both lived in uh, North London or something. I can't remember now. But we used to go and have drinks with him and his uh, wife and myself and my wife. He was a very humble, very nice guy. And then I got a call a few years later saying, oh, Gary wants you tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. Uh, I think it was Elstree Studios. I can't remember now. Cozy Powell had pulled out four days before the tour. So oh. I had to do the whole set. In four days. And oh, that's man. not just learning the songs. That's getting every little inflection. Gary was very insistent on it had to be exactly like the recording. And Cozy had been had the same brief. And I think that's why he left. Because he didn't want to be stuck, you know, playing the same drums every night. So he wanted a bit more freedom than that. You couldn't blame him. No, no. But Gary wanted it exactly like the even a little hi hat chip. He wanted that in, you know, there. Very demanding. He became very demanding on that, and he was a very demanding uh, person professionally. Very nice guy, personally. Very demanding professionally. Yeah, I getcha. I suppose at that level, though, you kind of have to be, but. Then, exactly like the record is a bit unreasonable, I think, when you're 
you know, when you say about the hi hat and it has to be there, and everyone likes it to be a diff- a bit different from the record when you're playing live. Yeah, well, you uh, you have to make it your own. That's mm. the trick. You've got to make it spontaneous. Even if you played it two thousand times before, uh, the same as ACDC. You know, you you would play back in black. How many times have they played back in black? You know, um, and it's got to be spontaneous. It's a, it's a trick. It's a professional trick. You learn how to do it. It's like you talking. You know, you you might have said the same thing a dozen times, but you've got to make it spontaneous. Yeah. And you've got to make it believable. If it's not, people just don't listen yeah. to anything, to either music or talk. Very true. So, um, Very true. It's, uh, every professional musician knows this. It's got to be spontaneous. Uh, when you play the same thing, it's got to come from your soul. It's got to come from your heart. It's got to come from your being. So it's got to be a spontaneous thing. Very true. Very true. Now, the podcast is called Concerts That Made Us. So I have to ask you some concert related questions, if you don't mind. First off, as a concert goer, what concerts would you say have made you? Uh, Concert goer. I'm not a concert goer. (laughs) I was thinking you might say that you probably didn't have time for much uh, concert going. No, I went with my son once to um, my youngest son to uh, download. And I think Slipknot were on, something like that. He wanted to see Slipknot. And so I went there and I was in the crowd and uh, I bought tickets, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they weren't freebies. And uh, yeah, he wanted to see that. So that's, I think that's one of the very few times I went to a concert, except to work. Um, I've been to many to work (laughs) i've been doing it now for 60 years yeah Um, it's a long time (laughs) so uh yeah it is Uh, tell me about it (laughs) um so i'm not much of a concert goer i listen backstage to what's going on because you can't avoid it (laughs) (laughs) and uh you know i don't uh don't like it much don't like uh being ankle deep in mud and uh, all the rest of it that goes with it. I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> well, the Chris Slade timeline then, for any listeners that haven't caught one of your shows, what is it like live? Give us the full experience if you can. Oh, well, I'm very proud uh, to be with this band because they're such great musicians, uh, tremendous musicians. James Comfort, the guitarist, and Mike Clark, the keyboard player and guitarist, have played together since they were 11 years old, and they're 35 now. So they're a pretty tight unit. And uh, Stevie G is uh, the singer and also the bass player. He has a, a, what can I say, a smoother voice, sorry, Ben, than Ben (laughs) Davis. Uh, who does the ACDC songs, and also on Sundance on the uh, original CD, our original CD, and Back with a Vengeance on the original CD. So uh, that's the band. We've been together for 12 years, same people. Uh, We drive to gigs. Uh, We don't fly, very rarely fly we flew to sicily i think and portugal once or twice but usually we drive even if it's to prague uh which takes about two days to get there at least but we drive all of us and uh it's tremendous the idea is to entertain the people we do half acdc uh about an hour we do two hours about an hour of ACDC, not all in one lump. We try, we split it up to try to make it entertaining. So we intersperse it with uh, Gilmore and Page and Uriah Heep and Run for Man's Earth Band, along with ACDC. But people want to hear ACDC, 
and we give it to them. We're not a tribute band. We play ACDC music. People only complain when at the end of at least two hours, I say, this is the last song, folks. <laughs> then it's like... <laughs> so um, it's a two-hour show. It's like the history of rock, really. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. You know, if you think of all the concerts, I know there's thousands that you've played over your career. Is there one that maybe sticks with you as the best? It just couldn't have got any better? Um, There's been quite a few, actually. Um, But I suppose you've got to say something like Live at Donington. That was a great... Uh, it was filmed fantastically well, and the sound balance was fantastic. It's a great concert. We had some great concerts with Mantra Band's Earth Band. We were, a, again, we were a good live band. We could never capture it on record. But uh, on stage, it was fantastic. It was like, uh, it was more like Cream than anything else, than anything we've ever recorded. Mick Rogers is. Uh, he's still with uh, Earth Band. He's a great guitarist. And we used to go off on musical tangents. You know, like a, like a jazz type thing, really. A bit like Cream. Off and then come back to a solo and then come back to a, a theme. It was a great experience. And I could use all my technique. Um, I started off playing jazz in the beginning when I was about 11, 12, certainly listening to jazz, 11 or 12 years old. And uh, so I always had that jazz technique uh, that I could use when needed. So with this band, I used uh, straight rock and jazz. You know, so... Um, that was a, a great band and a great experience. Again, we used to tear the house down, really, a lot of times. People are surprised by that because they they wouldn't expect that. It's the same with Timeline, actually. They, they don't know, unless they've seen us before, they don't know what to expect or how good the band is. It's always nice to hear when people say, you know, I haven't heard of you guys before. This is the best band I've ever seen. <laughs> and yeah. they mean that, you know? Yeah. That's the best way to have it, though. I'll have them going in kind of blind, not knowing what to expect, and then you can absolutely shock and awe them. Yeah, absolutely. James Cornford is a fantastic soloist. He gets standing ovations at the end of solos because people are like, I've never heard of this guy. Who is this guy? Yeah, and that's, of course, why I picked him, because he is so good, and they all are of that standard. They are music teachers in their day job, if you like. (laughs) As I say, they're they're only 35. To me, that's spring chicken, you know? (laughs) (laughs) True, true. You know, when it comes to showtime these days, how do you kind of psych yourself up and then afterwards how do you wind down <laughs> uh wind down with beer actually <laughs> um i never drink before a show i haven't forever mm. since at least the 60s we it's funny i was uh my first gig and the rock on bust was in the states and uh Drummer for Metallica. Uh, Le- Lars Ulri was there and I knew him quite well. And he suddenly jumped in front of me and went, Surprise! I went, All right. <laughs> Hi, Lars. <laughs> and he said, You've been standing here for like 20 minutes with a cup of tea in your hand and you haven't moved. And I, I do when I stand there, I, I don't even move my feet. And he said, You're on in about 40 minutes. Uh, what do you do to get yourself uh, psyched up? I said, we just walk on stage. <laughs> and he said, you know, uh, do you sort of limber up? And, uh, you know, I said, no. 
Not even Angus does that. And he just walks on stage and plays. And so do I, and so does everybody else. Brian might do whoop, whoop, <laughs> before he goes on, but that's about it. So he was shocked by that. He said, we've got, we've got people, we've got psychiatrists, we've got psychologists, we've got people for about two hours before a show, we talked to all these people to motivate us and get us to get on stage. And we play for half an hour before we go on. I said, Jesus, I'd be knackered at the end of that. Yeah, yeah exactly. You'd want to go to bed, never mind going on stage. Yeah. <laughs> so Metallica, okay, if Metallica want to do that. That's what they do. But ACDC, none of that, I'm afraid. Uh, maybe we should. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> there are people going, no, oh, you know, yeah, you can tell, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So winding up, I just have to walk on stage and I'm already wound up and ready to play. Uh, as soon as I sit on a kit, actually, any kit, anywhere, any time, I'm ready to play. So, you know, I used to practice all through my teenage years. Um, but I've always, after that, I was always working. So to me, I didn't need to practice. I didn't ever, I never have except for the early days, have a drum kit at home. And that was the early 60s. So, um, you know, I've never since then, even when I lived in the middle of the country, I've never played at home. I, I think it's just a thing that, uh, you know, I've been people here, even though I lived in the middle of the country at a house surrounded by countryside, even then I didn't. Yeah. Is it a kind of thing of that's your work and you want to keep it separate from your your personal life? Um, sort of, in a way, yes. But um, I found uh, and I find rehearsals and um, anything like that to be really boring, I'm afraid. Practices, uh, you know, it's I find it boring. And uh, that's the reason I don't like to do it. I might play on my knees now and again when I'm sitting. <laughs> but um, apart from that, hardly any. And people go, yeah, I can tell, I can tell. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't have complaints very much um, from anybody, except the trolls who say, you know, oh, yeah, he, he's crap. And he's not the real drummer for ACDC. You know. <laughs> oh, and uh, Brian has been in ACDC, what, 50 years? He's still the new singer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to a lot of people. Yeah. 50 years he's been doing it, I think. 40 or 50, anyway. Sorry, those trolls are just... You can you can have preference to somebody. You can say, oh, I think Bond was great. Yes, he was. You can say, I think Phil Rudd. Plays better than Slade. That's your opinion. It's it's a subjective opinion. It's your opinion. You might have a thousand people or ten thousand people who agree with you. It doesn't mean you are right. It's an opinion about anything. You can have an opinion that yellow is better than black, but it's an opinion. It doesn't mean anything. So. Um, these trolls are like, uh, you know, they think that their thought is it. Mm. If they think that, and other people think it too, so it must be true, you know? Yeah. Of, of course, Phil Rudd should be up there playing drums. He's not there now. I understand personal circumstances, yes. But um, quite often, it's been his own making. So he should be there. It's like he's the original. It's like Ringo Starr and the Beatles. You can't mess with that. But what they're going to do, stop, not work? ACDC, because Phil isn't available? No, they're not. People don't get that. And they say, oh, yeah, you know, you're not as good as Phil Rudd. And it's like, well, that's your opinion, mate. Doesn't mean it's true. Do you think that Angus and Malcolm would 
use somebody, me for instance, or Simon Wright or anybody, if they couldn't play, they say, well, he, he can't play drums. I've been doing it for 60 years. I think I know how to play drums. You know, and uh, who of these guys, these trolls, what bands have they been in? Who have they worked with or for? It's it's all very well saying, uh, you know, he can't play. Do you think I'd be a professional drummer for 60 years if I couldn't play, if I didn't know how to play? So, I mean, uh, you know, I wish they'd shut up, honestly. But they won't, of course. The majority of them are just guys sitting behind a keyboard anyway that have never been near a, a musical instrument, let alone a drum kit, you know? Exactly, exactly. You know, they're the greatest guitarists in their own front room. Yeah. <laughs> very true, very true. And before we dive into the last couple of questions then, future plans. I know you have a couple of gigs coming up. What can you tell us? Um, We always like to work, uh, timeline. And uh, that's all I do now. I'm not doing, I've been offered other things, but, um, you know, I, I don't like to work without the band. And uh, that's all I want to do. Um, we got a couple of gigs. They're not many, but next year there's going to be more. But um, I, I go back to pont in October, actually. I haven't been there for a while. My brother still lives there, my older brother, Danny. And he still lives there. I'm looking forward to doing that. And uh, we'll dive into the last couple of questions then. There are a couple of fun random ones. First off, besides music and the band, what are you currently obsessed with? Well, uh, the I am obsessed with one of the tracks, two of the tracks on the album, actually. Okay. On, uh, t- on Timescape, which is Time Flies and the End of Eternity. I played it yesterday for the first time for a couple of months. And I'm so impressed with everything on it, you know. My singing for a start, <laughs> I'm astounded at that. It just started with an idea for some echo, some repeat echo, some repeat, echo, some repeat some echo, some repeat echo, some repeat echo, some repeat. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and um, so impressed with James Cornford's playing. Actually, last night I was watching a concert in Prague. One of the great, greatest guitarists I ever worked with was on it, which is Guthrie Govan. And uh, that was impressive. I was with him for five to seven years in the band Asia. The, and he gave lessons to James Crawford in the beginning, before oh, wow. I knew James. I'm pretty sure of that. And... You know, two of the greatest guitarists I've ever seen, <laughs> which is Guthrie and James Cornford. So uh, you've got to be a really good guitarist to even know his name, actually, because he has no ego. He looks like Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> Guthrie, uh, long hair and a beard, and he has no ego whatsoever. And I'm proud to say I've played with him along with many people like uh, Pino Palladino, Tony Franklin, lots of other people like that, actually. I'm leaving a lot out there. But um, I just want to, when talking about timeline dates, um, I was hoping that they would, uh, we would get more dates next year, and I'm sure we will, and people are working on it. We're even talking about Canada now and Mexico, South America. Places like that. So uh, hopefully I can survive to do them. <laughs> <laughs> Any chance of getting you over to Ireland for some gigs? We've played Ireland and uh, I would love to. It was an enjoyable experience. What promoters don't realise is that the ferry is a long, long time, much longer than going to Europe from England. And it costs a lot, but they want you to play for like uh, 500 quid, you know. And yeah, it's not worth it. A Brit, uh, an English band, we're based in England, in Kent. 
you can't uh, you can't do it for that. You know, it's it's absolutely impossible. So, any promoters out there, dig deep, guys. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, the final question: So, out of everyone you've played with and every period in your career, what is the happiest? What one would you like to relive? Ah, uh, there's a few actually. All of it. <laughs> <laughs> good, good one. <laughs> Please, done <Dad and> tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've had a great time. You know, obviously, there's been uh, there's been you know a few mishaps or misadventures along the way, uh, but not that many. Uh, so I'm pleased the way it's gone. You know, happy times being 60s with Tom Jones. Oh, there's many of them, actually. Gilmore Tour was really great, really enjoyable, really enjoyable. That was 84. Earthband was fantastic, 70s. But in all, I've just enjoyed the whole thing, the whole experience. Uh, some negatives, of course, it comes into everybody's career and life, of course. But uh, I'm just happy to still be here, and I'm able to play drums at my age. Uh, I can't talk too good, but I can still play drums. <laughs> exactly. That's what that's what counts. That's what counts. <laughs> yep. Listen, Chris, this has been an absolute pleasure now. Thanks a million. Thank you very much. Thank, it's been my pleasure, it really has, and I mean that. Um, it's great to uh, be able to spread the words even uh, even at my age.
Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate and review us on iTunes and Spotify. And if you're interested in signing up the Band Builder Academy, use the link in the show notes below and enter the code CONCERTS and you'll receive 10% off. So, until next time, keep rocking. Hey, hey, what are you guys still doing here? The show is over. It's over. You can go home. Go on. We'll see you next time. We'll be here. Bye.